Continuing with what primarily is a video picture record devised from surviving archive film of the East Indies and British Pacific fleets, these are scenes of the cruiser Swiftsure approaching the flagship of the BPF on May 10th, 1945, as they refueled in the Kuti area during the second Sakashima operation. And Rear Admiral Brin is about to take a Jack Stay transfer to the KG-5 for a short conference with Admiral Rawlings. Although the previous day victory had been proclaimed in Europe, both the carriers Formidable and Victorious had also been hit by Kamikaze pilots, and, no doubt, this event would be high on their discussion list. Yet here we are left with a paradox, for in spite of the cameraman being on board the KG-5, one can find no film footage of this Kamikaze attack. But surely it defies belief he deliberately chose to ignore such an event. Yet as much as I've tried, I have never been able to find an answer to this perplexing question. In the background is the battleship Howe, as also you will shortly see similar brief views of the cruisers Uganda and Gambia. All ready for firing, sir? Stand by to fire. Aye, sir. Fire. Everything's under control. Oh, thanks, number one. Thank you. Stand by. Fire, sir. Attention. Let's go. Fire. And now, at some later point in time, the cameraman departs the KG-5 and records his own transfer to the destroyer undaunted. Though what he filmed next is beyond my knowledge. However, on conclusion of the second Sakashima operation, the task force retired south via Manus to Sydney, while the KG-5, in company with the destroyers Turgaman, Truebridge and Tenacious, sailed to Guam for a meeting between Admiral Rawlins and the American CNC Pacific, Admiral Chester Nimitz, filmed here from a helicopter as they're about to enter Apra Harbor on May the 28th. occupied by the Japanese for over two years until being retaken by American forces some nine months prior to the arrival of the KG-5 and her destroyer escorts. Yet even at this point in time, isolated pockets of Japanese still continued to resist and, unbelievably, the last of them did not surrender until 1960. Even more bizarre was the last known Japanese surrender of World War II which occurred on an island off the Philippines in 1974. But be that as it may, here Admiral Rawlins is about to proceed ashore to meet with Admiral Nimitz.
It is interesting to see the American Admiral casually attired in working dress, though the following day, when inspecting the KG-5, the dress code would, of course, be suitably formal. Some two months later, Admiral Bruce Fraser, flying his flag in the Duke of York, would pay an identical visit. But here now, the ship's company of the KG-5 prepare for the arrival of the American Admiral. All right, now listen, you rut. Gotta learn to march. Okay, march. Now, nice swing your arms now. The original task force had sailed from Leyte on May 1st as they deployed for the second Sakashima operation. And, considering it meant the KG-5 had been at sea for some 28 days before she arrived at Guam, to her credit, the ship's company appeared immaculately turned out for this occasion. And probably the destroyer crews were only too happy to view all this spit and polish from a comfortable distance. After the ship's inspection, Admiral Nimitz addressed the crew, and although I did finally manage to locate an eight-minute sound film of his speech, the poor audio quality precluded its use, though, as you will shortly see, I did insert the last half minute or so. In the main, he welcomed everybody to Guam, and spoke of the Navy's part in bringing about the defeat of Japan, and also reminisced about being invited aboard the carrier victorious at Pearl Harbor, in 1943 when she served briefly with the U.S. Navy. But here now is the end part of that sound film, where he concludes by saying, I hope we will meet again, God bless you all, followed by Captain Schofield calling upon his crew for three rousing cheers for the Admiral. Quite noticeably at that point, those original sounds ended, leaving me again to surmount the headache problems of devising and mixing a suitable soundtrack to complement the ever-present silence of World War II archive film, as meanwhile the Admiral is about to disembark. Liberty Man is the call of the bugle, and even though the stay in Guam was only two days, 
The opportunity to have a brief run ashore must have come as a welcome relief for many crew members who had not had any shore leave for some two and a half months. Being they had spent 32 days at sea during the first Sakashima operation, followed by eight days wide in Anko in the San Pedro Roads Lady, with no available shore leave before sailing on the second Sakashima deployment, which ended here, of course, in Guam some 30 days later. found awaiting them was this issue of beer and being supplied in cans was perceived as quite a novelty for it would be many years before that type of beer container became commonplace at home but at that moment i'm sure such things were far from their thoughts after departing guam the kg5 would sail directly to sydney while much to their chagrin the destroyers were diverted to Manus to await the arrival of the latest fleet carrier reinforcement, being implacable, and with other units, it would culminate into an attack on the Japanese-held island of Truk. Approximately two weeks previous to those scenes filmed at Guam, this footage was taken aboard the Indefatigable when the destroyer Tenacious came alongside with light stores and mail after having served from Leyte on May 14th to join the task force during the second Sakashima operation. And importantly, it also confirms there was at least two movie cameramen at sea with the force when it did come under heavy cover cars attacks. For as we saw at the beginning of this program, the other cameraman was aboard the KG-5. And it does stretch the realm of improbability even further that both these men would deliberately choose not to film these attacks. Certainly, if anyone can shed any light on this long remaining puzzle, I would dearly love to hear from them. For all my investigative attempts have proved inconclusive in my search for such film. Mail from home was always eagerly awaited, and the lucky crew members in receipt of such were invariably envied by other shipmates. Also well received was the fleet's own newspaper. Entitled the Pacific Post, it was printed in Australia and widely distributed throughout the entire fleet. Being in the Kuti replenishment area, the opportunity of hockey games and the wide expanse of the flight deck was always a popular event of relaxation for both participants and enthusiastic onlookers. Soon the fleet was back heading towards the Sakashima war zone to renew their attacks on the Japanese airfields of Mayako and the more dangerous island of Ishikagi. Certainly the main casualties of this campaign were predominantly the air crews, and after weeks of continual operations, the strain of battle was beginning to show, and replacement personnel were not available in profusion. 
But here a flight of Avenger aircraft are about to be launched as we listen to the deep-throated sound of the reliable Wright Cyclone radial engine. Obviously the camera is now aloft, though sadly, with the original film stock being severely edited, these airborne scenes will come to an abrupt halt and serve as another typical example just how much our Royal Navy archive film was so needlessly binned and trashed many years ago, being a deep and painful experience I have lived with throughout the making of this video series. Back on board the Indefatigable, we now hear the familiar sound of the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine as these c fires are ranged on deck for takeoff. The Implacable was the only other BPF fleet carrier which played host to this particular aircraft. Undercarriage problems were at times very frustrating with the Seafire, for basically it was just a modified Spitfire and never originally designed for rugged base carrier service. Late in July, units of the East Indies fleet comprising of the Nelson and Sussex, the escort carriers Empress and Amir, five destroyers and seven minesweepers sailed into the Bay of Bengal on Operation Livery. The Algerine sweeper Squirrel was blown up by a mine and her survivors transferred to the Nelson and for some three days the force was subjected to heavy attacks by Japanese aircraft. One kamikaze mortally hit the sweeper Vestal while another shot down by the Sussex caused damage as it exploded alongside. One report even stated that some 36 aircraft had been destroyed during this three-day operation. Yet the only film record of this event that exists in our archives are these few short passive scenes. And some 50 years on, one is again left bewildered by the reason for so much savage inconsistency in our naval archive film collection. In view now is another short East Indies fleet film which depicts an unidentified escort carrier refueling an equally unknown destroyer. Certainly footage of this fleet is extremely rare in our archives. Yet at this time in history, it consisted of two battleships, 16 escort carriers, a dozen cruisers and some 40 destroyers, plus well over 100 assortments of sloops, frigates, corvettes, minesweepers, depot ships and some 14 submarines. Almost all being unbelievably ignored by the movie cameras of the day, which is absolutely astonishing. Fortunately, the destroyer we're about to see close this escort carrier was easily recognizable as the Australian Man Norman. She served in both fleets and escorted the battleship Queen Elizabeth during an attack on the Japanese held island of Ramri. As a footnote, the N class were identical in construction to the J's and K's and were the last to be built of this handsome destroyer design. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
The last fleet carrier to join the BPF was the Implacable, and her first assignment was being part of a force which sailed from Manus in mid June of 1945 to attack the Japanese held island of Truk. And these are scenes of her flight deck activity as she prepares a squadron of sea fires with the specially procured fuel drop tanks. She also carried a squadron of fairy fireflies and Grumman Avengers, and all her aircraft were distinguishable by the coded letter N carried on the tailplane. That poor landing resulted in damage to a ferry firefly, and such incidents certainly kept the aircraft maintenance mechanics extremely busy, and having to work below decks when the heat of the sun was continually being absorbed on the armored flight deck, working conditions immediately below became at times almost intolerable. Good man, Bill. From Guam, the KG-5 arrived back in Sydney on June the 5th, while the following day, the Howe arrived from Manus and then sailed to Durban for a refit, on completion of which she would then relieve the Nelson as flagship of the East Indies fleet. But meanwhile, still in Sydney, and as a unique diversion from war, this wedding reception took place aboard the KG-5, and shortly to be seen in the next berth, 
the camera catches a very brief view of the first of the four light carriers to arrive on station, which I believe is the Colossus. Documented in the archives, the name of the groom is listed as Lieutenant Commander Fala Aranon. But be that as it may, at this point in time, Sydney was very active with naval shipping, and these scenes of arrival were filmed from the submarine depot ship Adamant. And though Fremantle was their main base of operations, in this instance, it would appear a large number of various personnel were taking passage on this particular journey to New South Wales. The Duke of York arrived there on July 1st and henceforth will become the flagship of the BPF, much to the consternation of the ship's company of the KG-5. The battleship Anson, although initially sailing east with the Duke of York, arrived at Sydney some three weeks later, having been delayed in the Port Tufik area for some bombardment operations. With the conclusion of the Sakashima operations, movement was now underway for the BPF to link up with the American Third Fleet, and the force, led by the KG-5, sailed from Manus early in July. And with the carriers indomitable and indefatigable detained in Sydney for repairs, only the victorious, implacable, and formidable, to which the latter, Admiral Vian, seen here on board her, had now transferred his flag, and these are further scenes filmed off her flight deck. The flight deck scenes have now shifted to the implacable, where these sea fires are to be seen in profusion to be shortly followed by views of her Grumman Avengers. As previously mentioned, the Colossus was one of four light fleet carriers to join the BPF. The other three being Venerable, Vengeance and Glory, though of course there was the air maintenance and repair carriers Unicorn, Perseus and Pioneer. But here the Glory is seen depart in Malta and would be the last to arrive on station just as the war was ending. She was eventually broken up at Inverkeithen in 1961, while remarkably the Venerable after serving in the Argentine Navy, is currently being broken up in India, just as I speak in this millennium year of 2000. Even more remarkable, considering these carriers were first commissioned in 1944, it is reported the Vengeance is in the process of just completing a two-year refit, though her name in the Brazilian Navy has long been the Minas Gerais. But here, in what can only be pure nostalgia, we will continue to watch the glory slowly depart the familiar entrance to Valletta Harbour, being representative of a scene undertaken by uncountable numbers of RM warships for well over a century, but alas, in the main, is now no more.
Other than the three post-war built Tiger class, the colony of Minotaur class were essentially the last of a long line of conventional Thai cruisers to be built for the Royal Navy, and a total of nine served in the East Indies and British Pacific fleets. Certainly they were handsome in appearance, as indeed were most of the RM warships of that period. And here, for pure indulgence, is some rare footage I found of one of these cruisers, which was obviously filmed in and around Malta. Of interest, the names of these nine colony and Minotaur class involved in the war against Japan were the Ceylon, Nigeria, Jamaica, Gambia, Uganda, Ontario, Newfoundland, Swiftshire, and the Bermuda, which was the last to arrive on station approximately the same time as the Belfast. The Bermuda, as seen here, commenced her long journey east from Scarpa Flow early in May 1945, and, after a brief workup period spent in the Mediterranean, she departed Malta on June the 6th, bound for Sydney by way of Ceylon. On what now follows are some magnificent views of this handsome warship. To relieve what can become a long, tedious journey across the Indian Ocean, some of the ship's personnel partake in pistol target practice on the quarterdeck, somewhat reminiscent of the activities seen on the destroyer Queenborough in the previous Phase 2 episode. Trigger, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what now follows is a more serious target practice shoot of her short range weapons. Almost all ships en route to Australia had a brief stopover, either at Colombo or occasionally Trincomalee. Though not particularly appreciated by the lower deck when arriving in port, was the ever-present likelihood of being detailed off to a work party assignment, and that which required a pot of pus's paint was not particularly high on the popularity list. 
But, as all souls knew, that well-used naval term as skyvin was always accepted as a good option, if at all possible. The Bermuda arrived at Sydney just as the war was drawing to a close, and thus never got to fire her guns in anger in the Pacific, while a similar situation also existed for the Inview cruiser Belfast, and, as we will later see, they would both eventually sail as part of a task force to Shanghai on the day of the Japanese surrender. Early in July, the two mainland cruisers, Maxman and Apollo, also sailed from Malta bound for the BPF, while the first surviving ship of this class, the Ariadne, would follow close behind, arriving in Sydney on August the 2nd. Like the Belfast and Bermuda, they were also just too late to take an active shooting part in the Pacific War. An astonishing total of some 30 sloops and frigates were also attached to the BPF, and one of them, seen here, is the White Sand Bay. An even greater number served in the East Indies fleet, but as were the BPF, finding footage of them is sadly almost virtually impossible. As well as Captain Walker's legendary U-boat hunter, HMS Stalin, the Amethyst, seen here, which achieved lasting fame with her 1949 ordeal in the Yangtze River, was also part of the BPF. Minesweepers were to be found in abundance, and especially those of the Algerine class, as seen here. They carried out extensive sweeping operations in the Malacca Straits prior to the occupation of Singapore, and similar duties were also performed in the approach area to Hong Kong, while many others had been used as escorts scattered throughout the various operational areas. But before I conclude this video history of both these fleets, I would like at some later stage to pay tribute to the many submarines which were deployed in the Far East, for their contribution has been largely overshadowed by the fleet carrier operations. Certainly one notable success was the sinking of the large Japanese cruiser Ishigara in the Banker Strait and the U-859 off Penang by the transient. Though of course other boats also had successful patrols, but sadly three are still on patrol to this day and eternity. Back in the Pacific, meanwhile, Task Force 37 continued sailing north for eventual operations against the Japanese home islands, which would commence after making contact with the huge American Third Fleet. This occurred in mid-July, and at that point of time, the KG-5 was still the BPF flagship. But once Admiral Fraser boarded the Duke of York and set sail from Manus, the flag was immediately transferred and, slightly out of time context, here are views of that occasion being filmed from on board the Duke of York herself. The trailing destroyers are the Welton Wager, while the distant third is unidentified. But here now is Admiral Fraser at sea for the first time as CNC of the BPF. Duke of York must be instantly ready. From Manus, the Duke of York would pay a courtesy visit to Admiral Nimitz on the island of Guam. But as we will eventually see, before she was finally able to link up with the task force, Admiral Vian's carrier squadrons would have completed their final operations against Japan due to the sudden and dramatic end of the war.
pause him perhaps to reflect on a somewhat humorous but little known historic fact regarding an aircraft in use with the BPF was what must have been the amazing sight of a supermarine walrus flying in the Pacific War Zone. It was both the oldest and longest serving aircraft of the war, and two were in service on the Victorious. Known affectionately as Darby and Joan, it would have been marvelous to have captured them on film operating from the flight deck, but sadly no movie camera appears to have been in use on the Victorious. They had no arrestor hook, and when landing on, many hands were in attendance to grab the machine as best as possible and bring it safely to a stop. They did occasionally rescue down airmen in close enough proximity to be even fired upon from a japanese held coastline. And one can only wonder what the thoughts of the Japanese might have been to see this large, strange-looking apparition, like some prehistoric bird from Jurassic Park, lumbering towards them. Only one of these two aircraft survived the war, and it would be nice to think it is the same one that is now on public display at the Fleet Air Arm Museum at Yeovilton. When the BPF arrived in the Pacific, direct sea battles with Japanese naval forces was largely at an end, and, except for the odd coastal bombardment, all attack operations were basically confined to carrier aircraft rather than big gun deployment. Though with the East Indies fleet, bombardment duties were more commonplace with small ships often playing an active role, whereas on the two occasions the BPF attacked Japanese shore bases, it was performed by the KG-5 and being once accompanied by the Howe. It was July 16th that Task Force 37 joined the American Third Fleet, and to resolve the intricate situation whereby both fleets would be best served in working together in the assault on Japan, Admiral Rawlins immediately repaired on board the Missouri from the destroyed quadrant to confer with Admiral Halsey. The Missouri was one of four Iowa-class battleships built during the war and ultimately became the most famous due to the historical onboard Japanese surrender ceremony. Only recently has she now been preserved as a museum ship significantly at Pearl Harbor. Although the fleet train tried hard to supply the RN task force with sufficient fuel, there were times when it became a bigger problem to Admiral Rawlins than the enemy itself. But Admiral Halsey always took a sympathetic view and invited Rawlins to refuel his ships alongside American tankers when it became really necessary. And here is one instance of that, with the KG-5 and the American destroyer Colette being simultaneously refueled, while the friendly banter between the crews is self-evident. Though I do apologize for the subsequent wild gyrations of camera swings, but had I tried to edit them out, the visual effect of this friendly banter would have been much less apparent.
some two or three weeks later, there was a similar occasion when it was both the KG-5 and the Missouri being refueled abreast of the same tanker. But I could find no footage of what must have been this very imposing sight. But here, much to the delight of the KG-5's crew, one of the fleet train supply ships is about to transfer fresh provisions. Certainly with the BPF now operating off Japan, due to the enormous distances it had to cover, the fleet train was now experiencing its most difficult assignment yet. As previously mentioned, during the last phase of the war, our carrier operations were largely directed against various targets located on the Japanese home islands. And in searching through the film archives, it would seem most of the surviving footage of this period was filmed from the implacable, seen here launching a flight of sea fires, which, because of their short endurance, were frequently used for combat air patrols, or more commonly known as caps. The following landing on scenes again emphasize the same old problem of operating Seafire aircraft on board carrier ships, and with the implacable carrying two squadrons of them, one is left wondering just how many spare propellers were carried on board to alleviate a logistic nightmare. Feature some rare footage whereby the cameraman becomes airborne with a flight of fairy fireflies during a hostile raid against Japanese home island positions. Right, stand by to take us. We're rolling. Good luck, everyone. Everybody, we've had our free warning. Keep your bloody eyes open. 
Obviously, the camera aircraft arrived safely back on board the Implacable, but one or two other planes were less successful when landing on. Our old friend, numeral 272, which we saw damaged in an earlier landing in the program, was again in trouble. But this time, the damage was so severe, she would be written off and dumped overboard. This is the BPF escort carrier Vindex, and both she and the activity which served in the East Indies fleet were the only two British-built vessels of this class in commission with both these fleets. The remainder, which totaled some 20 vessels, were all ex-US Navy, to which they were returned shortly after the war. It would appear in these following scenes that fleet train business was either just concluded or being aborted due to deteriorating typhoon weather conditions, which did prevail in this area. This did eventually culminate into a full-blooded typhoon and was filmed from the decks of the Indefatigable, though in such dark oppressive conditions, it did naturally have an adverse effect on the quality of the picture. Meanwhile, the cruiser in view is probably the Black Prince. Although heavily lashed down and secured, the flight deck aircraft did take a severe drenching in salt water spray, and after the storm, they all required being thoroughly washed down and cleaned, plus carefully having to examine and test the armaments and engines, for such failures could result in tragic consequences for the air crews.
In Sydney, these onboard scenes of the light carrier Colossus, with her crew fallen in for leaving harbor, were taken just as she is about to leave on the day Japan announced it had accepted the Allied peace terms. The two other light carriers briefly seen here are the Venerable and Vengeance, who would depart later on their own assignments northwards, all being concerned with the hectic and confused aftermath of the Japanese surrender. The carrier Glory would later sail to Rabaul, while the ultimate destination of the Colossus Task Force would be Shanghai via Leyte, and comprised of the flagship Bermuda, the Argonaut, and the destroyers Tumult, Tyrian, Tuscan, and Quiberon. Seen in the top right of the picture is obviously the Bermuda, whilst the destroyer Tyrion is about to proceed alongside on fleet business. objectives of this force would be to eventually fly off contact teams into Shanghai and organize conditions of the long-suffering prisoners of war prior to evacuation. 